to be honest, this is one of the sessions that I've been waiting for, and I'm super excited about it, is rewiring, reintroduction, and rehabilitation. So we have three fantastic speakers today, and let me introduce one by one. So first, we have Jelly Harms from Rewilding Europe. Please welcome Jelly. This one working as well? Yeah. Also, we, uh, uh, oh, um, sorry, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know you were excited to, to start. But <laughs> also, we have Stephen Cheke. And last but not least, Marna Smith. All right, so the microphone is yours. Please enjoy. Great, great. How is everybody doing? Still with us? Uh, everybody awake? Um, I was uh, told to, to keep it short and uh, have five minutes of time to, to leave uh, lots of room for discussions and questions. But I had so many, uh, many things in my head to actually talk about, so I was uh, putting things together yesterday night and I think ended up with too many slides anyway. So whenever I'm boring, just fall asleep and I know I have to speed up. But um, just I kept it very visual and very general as well uh, and I'd like to just uh, start off with um, a little bit of general information on how rewilding Europe is um, you know using different rewilding models in our uh, practices uh, and how that um, you know translates to uh, you know practical implications and examples um, so first off um, well, let, let me just uh, talk a little bit about Rewilding Europe itself. Who has ever heard of Rewilding Europe uh, yet? Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> Yesterday, <laughs> ah, that's great. <laughs> that's soon enough, soon enough. Yeah, yeah th we, we started off in uh, 2011 um, with um, a couple of areas. Um, now, right now, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we launched our 10th area in uh, Iberian Highlands in, um, in Spain. So we're super excited about that. Uh, other than that, we've been uh, using Earth Ranger only the last two years. So we're still uh, very early adapters, uh, but very excited in the, in the use uh, of Earth Ranger. Um, and uh, well, that's basically it. Well, you need to know. So we work across all these areas in, in uh, uh, rewilding Europe. And uh, in those areas, we use different rewilding models uh, for our practices. And I'll speak to that a little bit more. So what is a rewilding model? We see it as a, um, a definition of a mechanism that is, has the ability to generate a sustained impact uh, and to create incentives uh, for rewilding in a long run. So in the end, it should sustain itself both financially and uh, in a, any other way. You know? So it's, uh, we're there for the long run and in the end, we'd like to have wildlife come back and nature revive uh, forever. That's basically the, the way. And the way you can talk about that is in two different aspects, both on the landscape and habitat uh, level, which is the rehabilitation uh, side to this uh, presentation. The other one is the wildlife oriented um, phase, which talks more into to the um, return and uh, the natural return of species, the reintroductions and the reinforcement of species. And so to move on to landscape level, um, we basically use these five models in our areas. Sometimes they overlap in one area, so we use different models in one area. Uh, but but I'll, I'll touch on briefly the, these five models. Rewilding forests will mainly uh, transform production forests and uh, into you know, native or wild forests with high biodiversity by um, selective uh, felling of, of species or clear felling an uh, entire plot to, to allow for uh, natural regeneration of forests. Uh, then rewilding peatlands will speak more into the rewetting of um, peat, uh, peatlands to enable species to, to return and mostly uh, you know, uh, targeting bird species. Uh, it also allows for uh, carbon uh, sequestration 
Um, then rewilding rivers is mainly targeting, you know, the natural flow of rivers. In Europe, uh, about 60 percent of the of the rivers uh, or of the rivers contain dams that uh, are obsolete and hamper the quality of, of water. Uh, therefore, so um, by removing those uh, 100, uh, no, 1 million dams or more, uh, we hope to, to restore uh, natural flow in rivers. Uh, then deltas and flood plains. Similarly, by removing barriers in those, we, we um, re-wet areas and create wetlands. Uh, and then lastly, um, restoring natural grazing regimes, which opens up landscapes and uh, makes it more resilient to all kinds of, um, you know, disturbances by, by uh, or um, climate uh, changes and all that. Um, that's it for the um, habitat-oriented. Uh, part. Um, let's focus a little bit more on the wildlife-oriented um, uh, rewilding models. Um, I highlighted three of them. There's actually one more that I don't speak about, but uh, you'll find it maybe on the website later. Uh, one we go uh, wild for is the creating of uh, um, coexistence corridors, and I'll have an example ready for you later. Uh, it will allow the connection between um, species hotspots, um, mainly national parks, for example. So by removing barriers um, or mitigating human wildlife contacts um, and uh, increasing the, the population viability in that way. The second one is restoring trophic chains, and that speaks more to the reintroduction of, of key species and the reinforcement of, of species in those areas. And lastly, the transformation of hunting concessions uh, towards uh, nature-based uh, um, economies and, um, you know, the, like photo uh, photography heights that you see here, or um, local products and accommodations and all that. Um, so, ready for the first example. This is an example of uh, coexistence corridors in um, Italy. Uh, this is uh, about one and a half hours drive from, uh, from Rome. Um, beautiful area, the central Apennines. Um, over here you see four national parks in the, in the shaded uh, green, uh, which are connected by these uh, corridors that we identified. And we have a number of tools in those corridors that we uh, uh, deploy and able to, to assist the movement of the marsupin um, brown bear, which is under vulnerable um, uh, population numbers. Uh, so we're removing the um, barbed wire across those uh, sites. We are, uh, you know, uh, on the other hand, uh, there's a picture of a well that is, uh, you know, uh, basically dangerous for bears to fall into. So we we're securing those wells, we're securing uh, waste bins there, and we are placing um, uh, fences, uh, electric fences around uh, people's properties to, to you know, mitigate the uh, human wildlife uh, contact. On the other hand, we also um, uh, improved the habitat within the corridors by uh, pruning the uh, fruit trees there, so they uh, will go into better production that, that will, uh, you know, uh, leave the bears outside of the, of the communities where the people are uh, living. And we use earth range also for all kinds of alerting uh, whenever, uh, an, you know, a human wildlife conflict um, incident happens. Um, so that goes very well. Uh, second, um, the second example here is on the reintroduction uh, site. We just, like last year, uh, last week, reintroduced uh, the black vultures in Bulgaria. Uh, they were extinct for from the 70s um, onwards. Uh, so there was a, only a very small population left in the neighboring country of, of Greece. Uh, so they, they dropped dramatically. Um, so we did a couple of things there uh, by restoring the food chain. Um, so there is vultures in the area, but not the black vulture. And it has a particular uh, ecological function in that 
it opens up the carcasses. So this is normally the first one to arrive to a, to a new carcass. Uh, and with this beak being super uh, strong and uh, sharp, it can open up the carcass for other animals to, to enter. Uh, which was not the case in Bulgaria, so actually our team normally went out to find carcasses to manually open them for the, for the vultures, because also the, the griffin vultures and, um, and um, Egyptian vultures are doing very badly there. Um, so right now, as we speak, these guys are being introduced, they come from Spain, uh, and well, before they are being introduced, we did a bit of habitat improvement also by installing um, these artificial nest platforms in front of the aviary that was also specifically designed for this uh, purpose. Um, so that the young vultures will adapt to the, uh, to the location. They even, uh, well, seems to, to see the, the uh, options of breeding uh, sites. And then after a couple of months of uh, being you know, used to the aviary and the area, hopefully they won't fly back to Spain, but actually stay in the area. And uh, so that's exciting to see. So we tagged them all now, 17 um, uh, black vultures, and there's a lot of post-release monitoring going on uh, using Earth Ranger, of course. Huh? Lastly, the re um, wildlife comeback on the return and reinforcements in uh, Portugal. Um, so this is speaking more to the preparation of the habitat enabled to, to enable the return of the, of the Iber Iberian wolf. Uh, so we're doing different things there. Um, one is to restore the trophic chains by reintroducing roe deer, so to, to get the number of prey animals up in the area. So the, the, the wolf will actually be triggered to, to enter the, um, uh, the area again, as well as keep away from livestock of, of people. Uh, on the other hand, we also mitigate the human wildlife co uh, conflicts by um, providing uh, guard dogs to, uh, to farmers. Uh, and yeah, that's basically the, the system that's in place now and, uh, and the wolves are returning to that area. So that's another success there. Um, lastly, uh, let's cover a couple of considerations while um, rewilding and especially on species uh, reintroductions that we might find some you know, similar situations in your areas. Uh, one is maybe more particular to um, the European um, legal status of, of animals. So uh, many of our introduction species uh, have the legal status of being domestic animals, which is problematic. So when we reintroduce, for example, bison, um, we have a lot of obligations to, to do health uh, monitoring on them, um, round them up actually, and count them and uh, monitor for all kinds of diseases and all that. Of course, this is from a population stand of view quite useful to know how they are doing. On the other hand, you sometimes need to fence them off then, which is not the, the, the way you want it. Um, so that's a bit of an issue. So we, we looking into trying to, to resolve that and, and changing that status of, of those animals. On the other hand, uh, while speaking on wild versus, versus domestic animals, we do backbreeding of the um, extinct uh, aurochs um, that you see here uh, fighting with wolves in the picture. Um, we, we have a backbreeding program now with Tauros that is using different breeds across Europe to get towards this kind of traits of, of the Auroch. However, it has one, a domestic status. So you need to, uh, again, uh, tag, ear tag it and monitor it and all that. On the other hand, you still want to have the same traits of this animal be, uh, being able to cope with, uh, with wolves in the area. So they, they're kind of aggressive, which raises the question of the human perception of this animal. So, Whenever you see a cow like that laying around in the field, you're just like, oh, it's just a cow. But you know, that is not really the case in this case. <laughs> um, another issue we, um, we encountered or you know, consideration that you might have in the areas 
uh, while introdu introducing is the different breeds that you have in the area. And uh, one is, for example, uh, breeds of horses. In um, Bulgaria, we have two breeds there introduced. One is the Karakajan horse, which is the lovely looking uh, brown one on the, on the left hand side, which has been there for many generations and, uh, or centuries already. Um, and on the other hand, it's a newly introduced conic horse that used to be there a uh, long time ago. However, you know, we established a population now of conic horses that is expanding. Um, from a traditional point of view, you, you would not like to have those breeds intermix for some puri uh, purity reasons, but from a rewilding point of view, it doesn't really matter if they mix or not, as long as they do the function of um, keeping the grazing uh, pressure. So a bit of a consideration there. Um, that's, yeah, well, reinforcement when to stop is mainly, mainly speaking to carrying capacity that is quite hard to understand what your species numbers should be there in an area. Um, yeah, and there's different ways of tackling that. And lastly, the cross boundary work uh, that we cope with uh, in, in Europe is uh, causing a lot of, uh, you know, paperwork as well as um, having to be quite um, crea creative in some times, you know, to get animals across uh, uh, on time. So um, that's it for now. So I'll be taking you through on uh, that rewilding and the use of it in uh, or how we can use earth ranger. Is that better? Yes. Good. So again, I don't think I need to bore you with the introductions. I think you already know that. I can save that list. But most importantly, I just wanted to highlight this slide here. And um, my colleague, my other presenter, talked about the rehabilitation. I've looked at it in different ways here. Uh, why I talked about the animal is because I wanted to include animals that are, sometimes they are rescued animals and they need to be rehabilitated before they go back to their wild and also the range lots because you don't want to take animals to a place whereby they don't have enough, uh, the habitat is not good. So the other area now is uh, mainly their introduction. People like calling it, it can also be an introduction to a new area or and that's what happens and what do we do in Kenya. And uh, there, there are different areas that we look at into even before animals are reintroduced or translocated into a different area. And uh, some of them is uh, habitat water assessment, the security risk assessment, disease risk assessment, what about <coughs> the socioeconomics. And when I was writing this list down and having listened to most of the presenters yesterday and today, and how we can use the Earth Ranger. You know, I was coming up with so many ideas, and I think if it's really a tool that we can use, it's uh, something that can be very useful. And uh, just to, and I'll force people now to listen to the disease. <laughs> if you look at that aspect of the disease risk assessment, and if I can highlight, in the year 2004 in Kenya, we had uh, the mountain bongos being repatriated from uh, America, North America. They came into Kenya, and uh, you can imagine what happened. A good number of them actually died of uh, disease, which is a tick-borne disease, not new in the country, but I think in a way we missed it out. And so this was a naive population coming from uh, America. Yes, the original parents had come from Kenya, but when they were repatriated, now a good number of them were already naive. And I was looking at if, for example, we had something like Earth Ranger or even whatever the data, database that you have, to inform what kind of diseases are available in this particular area. When you're looking at the habitat, and uh, somebody yesterday mentioned about the, the NDVI and the changes over time. If we have a tool like Earth Ranger that is able to keep all this information, maybe it makes us actually our life very easy to go back and be able to get that information for better information uh, for decision making. I added something there on the socioeconomic impact. And uh, again, if you don't think, and this is mainly the people, 
surrounding where you are taking these animals to. I think that can also determine your success of your introduction uh, program. Um, maybe many animal people never think about that, but it's a big, big uh, thing that uh, somebody needs to understand. And even when the animals, uh, even before you move them, if you're talking about individuals, let's say the case of a black rhino. In Kenya, we have, uh, I, think, I think, 17 sanctuaries, and they are all managed as one meta population. So you need to understand even the different individuals. How are they doing? What are their reproductive rates? How do you compare with the different areas? Because even as you do the introduction, that becomes easy. Which gene pool actually you're moving to the next one? How do you get to know that information? Sometimes you have it, but maybe in a dis disjointed way. So I know we know that. We have not really used Afranger to collect that kind of information, but I'm thinking to me, that is an, a good area where all that information can come together. And because it's a uniform platform, if you decide now to use it across the whole country, it becomes a better thing uh, for us. And then there is a translocation of the species as you do that, you know, after you have done all your assessment, making sure that the area is good, it's secure for these animals. They have enough food and uh, water. Uh, is it the right water quality and we have had issues uh, with uh, black rhinos in Kenya. Yes. So there are different things that uh, you can keep. So again, this morning, I think uh, 51 degrees, they give a presentation talking about how they're using Glora, Earthranger, at Lewa. And uh, they talked about different things, including uh, the soil analysis that they're doing, they're collecting that data. And uh, again, thinking like a veterinarian, I was asking myself, yes, that's actually very important. Diseases like anthrax, what do you know, anthrax spores will survive in alkaline soils, very high in calcium. So if that data is already available somewhere, it can help us maybe even predict the chances of uh, having that kind of a disease in uh, such an area. And then you come to the next phase, which is the release, or the post-release. And uh, again, you want to make sure that when you take your animals to the site that you have taken them to, they are, it becomes successful. Are they adapting to the new environment? What is their home range? You know, things like, how are they doing in terms of their body condition? Are they integrating with other wildlife species? species? And again, home range. And I'm talking to, I'm preaching to the choir here. So I think those are different ways how you can, uh, I think we can use the earth range. So I was thinking different opportunities. I think we haven't used in all of them, but there are some that we have used. Uh, that doesn't mean that it comes alone. You have to also think about other technology, like how do you achieve, how do you get to know uh, where the animals are. So things like the collars, camera traps, they have been also very key in terms of uh, not only where the animals are, at least you can visualize and see the body condition scores of these different animals. And that can help you get to know how they are adapting to the new environment. That's observational data, you know, as much as we talk about uh, technology, we still need the people on the ground, the eyes there, which are observing and letting us know what is happening. So that's a screenshot that I was given by Giacomo from STE. And just a quick example. So these elephants named here, Shaba, Shurai, Kalama, these are some of the orphan baby, orphan elephants that were taken to Reteti, Reteti again in Samburu, rehabilitated for a good number of years, up to three years, three to four years old, and then they were released back to the wild, which is in the nearby conservancy, I think 60 kilometers apart. And uh, they have been tracked to get to know where are they spending their time, are they integrating with the real wild animals, and again, the use of earth range, I think uh, it has already proven itself that it's a useful thing. So I think that is a good picture to show. And uh, again, so, so these elephants, the ones I've just talked about, they were 
taken in different groups. This is after the rehabilitation at uh, Sarah, no, Retetti, sorry, and they were taken to Sarah. And all these were collared by our partners, the Save the Elephants Kenya Wildlife Service. And uh, you can be able to see actually their movement in addition to the resources, like things like uh, the water. And again, what I understand, all that information can be captured in the earth ranges. And this is what we were trying to explain that if we get data or information in one platform, then it becomes easier for us uh, to make the decisions. So these are photos I've taken from, uh, this is all from uh, JOC, which is at the NRT, Lao headquarters. And again, you can see these are very clear f images. And if you're interested to know what these different animals are doing in that area, at least you can, at least you can, uh, the, like for example, the body condition score, because that is important. You can tell even the time, what time are they visiting the waterholes. And there are many other species, not only the ones I have highlighted there. Yeah, something that came up, and I know, I don't know how much we have done it in Kenya, is the, the use of the LoRa, which is a long range wide area network. Uh, I was trying to get information from colleagues. So all these are not my words, eh? but I got them from most of the people who are dealing with this. And uh, the advantage I was told is uh, it's optimized to use very little power, which to me, I think that is a big advantage if it's something that can be used for animal mon uh, monitoring of the animals. And you find that these are, it's actually equipped with the sensors that can directly you know, you put them in an animal, for example, the rhino, and uh, that's a picture, the one on your right is uh, a foot collar in a rhino. South Africans have done it, we haven't done it in Kenya, but I know we have plans to see whether that is something that uh, we can use. Uh, again, I think uh, 51 degrees this morning they mentioned uh, with the rhinos at Lewa. So, Lewa rhinos, they have been, this information dating back to since 1980s. And all that information, they were able to bring it into Earth Ranger, which that was actually, it's something very fascinating because, uh, and they say it, they are now sharing with KWS and other partners. So when you're making those decisions, it becomes uh, very easy. Uh, Loisaba, which is one of the uh, private ranches, I know the plans to introduce uh, uh, black rhinos. I'm not sure which date, but that is happening soon. So maybe those are some of the things that uh, we'll be looking at uh, using. And uh, rewilding or introductions, again, comes with its own challenges. Uh, everybody knows about climate change, or the effect of drought. I think uh, we have faced some challenges whereby, yes, you have reintroduced some animals the drought comes, you're forced to supplement them. And when you do the supplementation, then again, that can also lead to habituation, but you still need to uh, make them survive. And also, when all animals are crowded in one area, also there is a high risk of uh, disease uh, trans transmission. Again, other than naive populations, the ones we have with the disease, also most of these animals, maybe they don't know uh, there's a predator. So these are some of the challenges that uh, we do experience and uh, yes, they do happen. And again, something like uh, conflict, you take them to a new area. Uh, sometimes not all the comf uh, communities are comfortable with that or you can end up having issues of the conflict. We were asked to come up with a new name. I still didn't have it, the, the conflict, so I still kept it. Yes, and uh, I want to stop there and uh, thank everybody. My name is Marna Smith. I work for Ashia Cheetah Conservation. Um, does anybody here know Ashia Cheetah Conservation? I feel like we're fairly unknown at the moment. Um, so we are based in South Africa. We are an NGO and we're focusing on rewilding of captive cheetah or orphan cheetah cubs. We also focus on reintroductions into open systems or in private game reserves. 
and then we are also focusing on helping assist scientists and researchers with just getting data together for their work. Okay, um, so what I'm pretty much going to talk about today is mostly just the reintroduction work that we're doing. Um, they've covered pretty much welding and translocation a bit. I will point on a few things, but I will try and keep it, in the spirit of keeping it short, I will try and keep it to the point. Um, sorry, one second. Not my computer. There we go. Okay, so permitting. I feel like this is a roadblock that a lot of people struggle with and then they get to the end result and then, oh shit, the permit, sorry, I just cursed. <laughs> um, the permit has not been issued yet. You're waiting for your CITES permit. It's always, always last minute and that happens so often. So we've kind of realized you start with permitting as soon as possible. Even if you don't even have the animals yet, you get that process started. You let the authorities know, you get them on board, you get them excited about it. And that way you usually do manage to get things done in a fairly timely manner. And things change. I mean, the between different countries, it's different, different animals, it's different. You need to go through so many different statutory authorities to eventually get to the one person that could potentially help you. And then you find out, oh, that's not the right person to talk to. So then you have to try again a little bit. And I'm sure there's people in the room that know that does happen. Um, secondly, once you've got your permitting done, is just the welfare associated, and it's great to talk about the veterinary aspects of it, but there's the actual welfare of the animal that should be considered, especially with the logistics involved. Um, you want pretty much to be sure that at the end of the day, even though your paperwork is in place and you know, sorry, let me just move this down, is that things can go wrong and usually things will go wrong as well. So you need to have every single possible, oh hi Craig, sorry, I just saw you there. You need to have every single possible thing that could go wrong. You need to have a plan B, plan C, plan D, plan F. So uh, it's unfortunate hearing about all the, the tragedies that has happened with people that are translocating animals. There's um, equipment that fails, there's vets that don't really know that much about the species they're working with and then you think that they know what they're doing and you're relying on them and then you end up with a horrible result because of it. So you go through your vet, you find a vet you're comfortable with, you find uh, logistic support that you're comfortable with, you find aircrafts that you know are always on time and they're never late, you find vehicles that work for yourself. So all of that comes together to making sure that the welfare of the animal is the priority of your translocation. And then lastly, um, no translocation or even no reintroduction should be attempted without the, the complete commitment and the, the responsibility that you take on of actually doing the post-release monitoring and the active management of the animals thereafter. You've taken the responsibility of this animal. You can't just drop it off and expect it to be fine and make it the problem of your final destination. You need to be part of it. And you need to continuously contribute to the feedback loop as well. I mean, it's essential to do that, to do better in the future as well. So to that end, um, Ashia has pretty much, I think we're starting to create one of the, the largest cheetah-specific databases and it's continually increasing. This is just an example of my amount of collars that I have in South Africa. There's further collars in Southern Africa, there's in Zambia, there's in, Bots not, sorry, not Botswana, there's into Namibia. There is also into Mozambique and also into Malawi. So we are compiling all of this information. It includes the tracking information from the collars. We are trying to get all the behavioral information that we can. We are making sure that we get all the mating and breeding events that happen, any injuries, and then to help advise on how to intervene with the injuries that has happened. We compile all the data around mortalities and then we are also making sure that we get a good genetic roadmap of what we are doing all over the place as well. And of course, in order to collect um, all of the information above, we uh, use CyberTracker, um, we use Kobo Toolbox, hopefully now ER Mobile we're going to be using. That will help a lot because the issue with working on so many different landscapes and so many reserves and so many different managing teams, everyone has their own preferred way of collecting data. And to try and get everybody on board in assisting us in to creating this data set is that people should be comfortable with what they are using to monitor. So we are always try and to work with them on that. And then if that doesn't work, there's always WhatsApp groups. I mean, that's, I think everybody is on a thousand WhatsApp groups, except when it like stops for the day because it breaks down and then everybody's screwed. Um, so yeah, so those, those 
data collection is pretty much what we use. We use this knowledge so that we can report and the behavioral rehabilitation that we usually do see in individuals that are being translocated, especially cheetah individuals who go from a fence reserve, which is what South Africa is pretty known for. We do, have, we do believe in fence conservation, but translocating them into open systems, it's interesting seeing that change in behavior. So we actually relocated a male last year, November, into an open system. He came from a 300 square kilometer reserve and he went into a, how big was it? 10,000 square kilometer open system, no fences. And even though it's super exciting to see him do that movement and increasing his home range and seeing it, it's also um, extremely terrifying because he doesn't know when to stop. He doesn't know where the natural geographic lines are where he should maybe turn around and go back to the safe space. So he managed to walk um, within a space of two months. He um, walked to the two opposite poles of the urban system, um, about 140 kilometers apart. And they had to unfortunately intervene both times to get him just to change his direction. And that's various ways of intervening in a, on a management level. So that is hazing them back down, supplement feeding, and trying to lure them back to the safe space. But um, it is definitely a worry. But the reason for collecting the data and the reason for compiling all of it is so that we can inform with the next reintroduction, saying be aware of this with the next reintroduction. The cat is going to roam. The cat will display this, this and this. And this is what systems and protocols you should have in place to follow through. Because there's no point in collecting data if you're not going to learn from it and you're not going to actually use it for your management. So um, that's why we, we do believe in intense monitoring of this cheetah during this anchoring period. So we use geofencing, we use on the ground tracking. Uh, we have people on the ground. We ensure the reserves have additional support when it comes to monitoring so that we don't leave them um, alone out there. Um, so yeah, we, we make sure that we try and get as much support to the reserves as possible. Another um, acclimatization issue, um, so that's not only just to the vegetation or how to hunt or how to hide in it, but also to become familiar to the, the prey species. So it's a bit terrifying watching a cheetah that's used to impala and spring rock and suddenly it's seeing a black lechway in front of it and you kind of have the sinking feeling in your heart going like, damn it, don't you do it. But then they do it and then they surprise you and then they actually manage so it's amazing to watch, but like I said, it's absolutely terrifying because you've invested so much time and money and effort into this animal, and then the first time he hunts in this new open system, it's all for nothing. But unfortunately on that though, it's mortalities due to hunting is a reality. They, it's a very common way for these cheetahs to unfortunately die. Um, but that's why, from a technological point of view, it's so amazing how, so I was at the that, um, what was the, the, the presentation where the cluster, clustering information, stuff like that, so to use that to inform us on where the kills are, to help the monitor on the ground to quickly go and check, great, the cheetah has hunted, no injuries, fantastic, but at least I know where to go look in this 10,000 square kilometer area. You can't just rely on making sure that the tracker and the monitoring of the collars are going on. You need to make sure that you get a visual and you make sure that the animal is good. And then, um, ultimately, um, one of the, the biggest reasons for developing our data set to such an extent is to, to focus on determining what is actually a successful reintroduction. We can't just do it and think we're doing the right thing. We need to show we manage that and we are doing, continuously doing the right thing for the animal. So, be it to focus what's um, the difference between releasing a cat in a fence reserve or a huge open landscape, um, what's a timeline that we should give this animal to settle, I mean, when do you intervene and when do you say, okay, this is not working, I need to remove my animal out of it, um, what behavioral change we would like to see over a certain period of time, and the faster these reintroductions continue to expand, we need to create the best practice protocols so that we can inform everyone. So I want to highlight, though, that with our data collection, we do are planning on making it open source. Anybody can come to us and say, listen, do you know this, this, or this about cheetah information? We are super, super happy to share. And um, it's for the welfare of the species. So at the end of the day, any information is good information if you utilize it. And I think that's pretty much it. I try to keep it quick, as you guys could notice from the, the rate of my speech. So <laughs> um, any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, then, yeah, that's it. Thank you.